Hello and welcome to Brooks TV News. I'm David Halligan. And I am Damie Verslice. And jumping right into our lead story today, it's the winter season and time to keep warm outdoors. But for those living on the streets, winter is a difficult time as temperatures plunge. Our reporter went to speak to those who are often seen but seldom heard. The beautiful city of Oxford is home for thousands of students from all around the world. However, the streets of Oxford are literally the home for some people. The only reason why I become homeless, someone did something bad to me. He stole my old documents and um, I didn't have a name and surname for a long time. Uh, to go to ambassade to get another new passport, it cost me £240, which is too much, especially when you live on the street. Oxford was ranked fourth for homelessness in 2011 and the number of homeless people have increased by 60% during the last year. Clearly, homelessness is a massive problem in Oxford. If you walk down pretty much any street, I think you'll see homeless people. And it doesn't really seem like the problem's getting any better either. Um, in fact, I know they closed a few uh, shelters for homeless people recently because of government cuts. It's, it's a disgrace, really, in the 21st century that people are having to live on the streets and have nowhere to live. But I can understand why the cost of accommodation in Oxford is unbelievably expensive, both to rent and to buy. What's the most important when you become homeless? You always have to have a toilet paper. Also, toilets open 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, depends. Um, uh, no, I need a shower in the morning before I get a job. How can I go ask for a job? if I don't look good myself, you know what I mean? If there's anything I'd like to change about the streets, it's the amount of mental health problems coming on the streets. But that's not fair. It's not fair to them. And the amount of people that I know that have got addict, addictional problems, like the heroin addicts, that go into prison, get totally clean, and they're thrown back on the street. That should change, because if you, if you kick your habit, let's give them somewhere to go and sort of put them straight back on the streets so they're going to pick up their habit again. Because all you're doing is feeding the circle, it's not going anywhere, and a lot of money. We should help each other. Be polite, nice, no be violent, and have a big heart, and love each other, help each other. I'm going to go in a minute selling big issue. That's my badge. I've got free magazine. I hope I'm going to do very well. It is debated that help is on its way to solve this issue. So will this continue to grow or will it come to an end? This is Dina Salah, Brooks TV. Now moving on, on to student housing regarding the student accommodation. The relationship between students and their money is a fleeting one at best, especially for those in full-time education. Food is expensive, so are textbooks, heating and finding an affordable place to live. Our reporter went out to ask, is Brooks accommodation worth what students pay? The most important thing in student life is staying in a good and reasonable accommodation, especially when they are far away from home. Students always prefer to find cheaper accommodations as it is an additional expense, which generates the question, is the accommodation is costlier than other universities and private ones? Our research shows that Oxford Brooks has one of the costliest accommodation across UK. Compared to other universities, Brooks accommodations are much costlier up to 20 to 30 pounds a week. From our research, we found that Brooks accommodation prices are more or same like London City. Other universities are providing accommodation facilities from 80 pounds to 160 pounds for a week, where Brooks charge up to 200 pounds per week. The options they provide vary from non institute to institute and studio rooms. However, the university provides accommodation options from eighty pounds per week for undergraduates and hundred and seven pounds per week for postgraduates. The head of Oxford Brooks Accommodation Bureau spoke to us about their pricing and details. You're right. We are, when you look at it on a national scale, quite expensive in the sector. However, there are some very, very straightforward and obvious reasons for that. So Oxford is enclosed entirely by Greenbelt land. 
which means that the city cannot expand outwards. Okay, so that makes any land that becomes available in Oxford very much sought after. As a result of that, the direct effect is that land prices are very, very high. About their opinion on accommodation pricing? The amount we pay, I don't think it's worth what the buildings are like, to be honest. Like maybe the new renovated ones, but definitely not these. Okay, I feel that they're kind of high, but um, it's because they give you like a lot of security. It, I feel like this is a safe place. I think it would be better if they subsidize the fee rate or at least since they are taking this much fees maybe they must have a kind of consideration in the discount for the accommodation. Most of the students feel that accommodation price here is too expensive. However, from the explanations we got, it seems that students will have to pay more for their accommodations in coming years. This is Teja Suryavath, Brooks TV. The Oxford Chinese Students and Scholars Association run many events, and one of the biggest is the yearly Chinese and Asian Food Festival. The event is running for the second time, and the exposure of the event is making it more and more popular. Many Chinese and internationals took the opportunity to enjoy their home food. As part of the Chinese Cultural Week, the Oxford China Student and Scholar Association ran the Oxford Chinese and Asian Food Festival and is fully sponsored by the Chinese Embassy in the UK. We interviewed Nat Chen, who will talk more about the celebration. So we've um, partnered with the Chinese Students and Scholars Association to create this event to promote Chinese culture. Today is actually the Lantern Festival. It's the last day of the Chinese New Year. So we wanted to uh, make an event for our fellow Oxford classmates and uh, fellow Oxford students to show them how delicious Chinese and Asian food is and celebrate culture by t uh, doing Tai Chi and Chinese calligraphy. A huge collaboration between Said Business School and Oxford University was made to create this event and we are luckily to meet Kei Chun, one of the business students, to tell us how they organize it. Like a month ago to kind of discuss how we want this to be and eventually we made, a, we made it a huge collaboration between the business school and the university. Yeah, and we're responsible for uh, finding the venue, letting us, letting our classmates know what's going on, finding the vendors, provide the food, advertising it, and just make it a fun experience for our students. The event has mostly invited only Chinese students in previous years, and from now on is open to other students of different Asian backgrounds. Masrura cited that it is important for her Indonesian society to be part of this event. This is very important for us because not, we're not only selling uh, the food to, uh, to people here, but actually we promote, we promote our country, we promote our tourism, actually we promote our destination, we promote our country through the food. The number of visitors increased as time went on and many were satisfied with the food provided. Quite overwhelmed, there's a lot more uh, people than we expected. We aimed for around 200 there probably has been around at least 500 so far. So we've, we're really ecstatic about the turnout here today. The event will keep running for next years and in the future, the organizers think of hiring a bigger place to run the food festival because many students of different backgrounds are interested to try the Chinese and Asian food. This is Dana Haddadin for Brooks TV. Our next story is also about food, and unlike those Chinese meals being cooked, our next item being served is a little raw. People always need fresh food for a balanced and healthy diet. The choices of the source food comes from is important to some. Our reporter found that out that one supplier originated here in Oxford. She went to find out more. Fresh produce may be available in supermarkets, but if you want to source local foods, one traditional place to buy and just as easy to reach is the local market. Food accounts for 25% of the distance traveled by lorries in the UK. 
Cultivate is an organization which provides local food to consumers in Oxford. So Cultivate's purpose is to provide Oxford and Oxfordshire with organic local produce. Uh, so the idea is to have as few food miles as possible and to promote uh, a different style of shopping and growing. In their shops, consumers are able to see the producing farmers and buy as much as they need. The price is dependent on the weight of products. Cultivate was started by four Oxford graduates about four and a half years ago. Uh, and they wanted to significantly change how people buy their food. Uh, again, kind of reducing carbon footprint, um, improving like, food standards and people's health as well. According to Low Carbon Oxford, local products make up less than 1% of Oxford purchases. Over 99% comes from other areas outside Oxford. Well, I'm glad that local product is available here and um, I'm very pleased that it is because it's always a good thing to buy locally whenever possible. Yeah, it's good. I mean, as long as it's grown sort of organically as such and it's, it's nice to put something back to the community, to the small growers rather than the bigger supermarkets. We made a big decision to shift from growing ourselves to supporting more of the local farmers. Uh, and by doing that, we've been able to, to help other people into, into farming. Um, whilst also getting more people to, to see the benefits behind organic and local produce. Cultivate provides an important choice for Oxford consumers to buy locally, giving them the option of purchasing fresh, ethically sourced produce. As more and more people become concerned about environmental and food sourcing issues, the success of companies like Cultivate is set to continue. Brooks TV, Ketachka Hudson. Well, that's it for this half. After the break, we'll be talking to Dr. Halbert Jones of the Rothermere American Institute about the current state of American politics and if this is something the world has seen before. We will see you after the break. Welcome back. Coming up later, a story on the LGBT community. But first, the American elections dropped a surprise assault on the world when Donald Trump defied the polls and won. But what influence, if any, did the American voters abroad have in the recent election? I think one thing uh, that's significant, uh, of course, uh, American citizens living anywhere in the world are eligible to vote uh, in the, uh, the federal elections. Uh, and there is a very significant number of American citizens uh, who live in the United Kingdom, of course, uh, approximately. Estimates vary, but it may be between 200 and 300,000 uh, U.S. citizens who reside here in Britain. Uh, that makes it the third largest expatriate population uh, outside, of, um, outside of the United States, uh, with, of course, Canada and Mexico, our, our immediate neighbors, being uh, the two largest destinations. Um, of course, the, the way that the presidential election works is that uh, votes are cast in specific states uh, and, it's, uh, and that determines the outcome through the electoral college. So the influence of American voters resident in Britain would be diffused through the various states in which they are registered, through their original home states. Um, but um, because the, the election was so close uh, in so many states, uh, even a relatively small number of votes from abroad you know, had the potential to, uh, to shift the balance somewhat. So it's, you know, again, it's always the message to, to voters that uh, you know, it's important to, to get out there and, and cast your ballot, particularly in the American context if you're from a swing state, one that's very competitive. Okay, and uh, did, uh, how much impact do you believe uh, the overseas vote had on the elections? Uh, this, is, yeah, this is something we've, we've tried to look at at the Rothermere American Institute, and um, I think what we identified is the fact that the potential influence of overseas voters uh, is, is quite great, um, but the other factor that has to be acknowledged is that Historically, traditionally, participation rates by overseas voters have been uh, quite low. Um, so I think I, I don't think there's obviously there was a lot of mobilization and interest in this uh, in this electoral cycle. I don't think we have the figures uh, to hand as to as to 
how much, by how much overseas participation may have exceeded uh, traditional norms in this cycle. Um, but it probably um, remained relatively low, in part because voters based overseas, um, many of them uh, you know, may have been resident outside of the United States for many years. They may feel less connected to U.S. politics. They may feel, of course, more connected to the countries in which they, they currently reside. Um, but uh, there is that potential there for all the, you know, the, the quite vast uh, expatriate population uh, of Americans abroad uh, to have uh, an influence in these competitive uh, elections. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is your view on the border wall that was introduced by the new president's legislation? Uh, yes, I think um, I mean, it's a very controversial proposal, but one that was clearly very popular uh, with his base, with his, his core supporters on the campaign trail. It was the refrain at his boisterous rallies that, uh, that he would build a wall and that Mexico would pay for it. So this was a very popular line uh, among those who were sort of concerned about uh, immigration, concerned about border security. Uh, I think um, as a, as I'm in fact a, a sort of something of a specialist in, in the history of U.S.-Mexican relations myself, so I see the potential uh, clearly for this to uh, really aggravate uh, bilateral relations, to, to take the relationship right. back to much less uh, friendly That's uh, so ground. very interesting, but mm. I'm afraid we'll have to wrap it up. Okay. Thank you very much for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Now, did you know that February is the LGBT History Month? The Bit River Museum is hosting a series of events over the month. One is a party celebrating the LGBT community. Let's have a look at the outgoing event out in Oxford. More than 200 people attend to out in Oxford to celebrate the LGBT History Month at Pitt River Museum. We've been involved in organizing a display and this is LGBT History Month and so um, it's fantastic that Oxford is so engaged with the celebrations of raising visibility of the LGBT community this year. To help people understand that there is a great diversity of people. The museum works with LGBT communities and volunteers to light up this amazing month with a series of meaningful and fun events. I'm going to be talking about dressing all faggoty and shamanic. I think tonight's great, um, but I'm wondering if all the lasers in the main room will damage the artifact. This event includes some short talks, live performances and workshops a lot of people put the symbolic rainbow color on their face and dress to engage in this event. I think it's amazing that the museum is doing something like this. That kind of mixed with the idea of uh, celebrating being queer was like basically my dream come true. I just love looking a bit different and actually just love life. Um, this is an amazing event where anything goes and everyone is, is accepted regardless of sexuality, gender, background. And that's so important in 2017. There's a coming out story section for the participants to donate their stories. I came out about age seven, had my first girlfriend, Kelly, and we used to playfully push each other over in the playground <laughs> because we liked each other. I think that's how we expressed it. And uh, the thing is, I also like Stephen Gately, so she didn't like that. I didn't have any role models of um, anyone who was gay or even bisexual, so I, I didn't know whether I was allowed to like both girls and boys. After years of effort, more and more people are willing to stand up for love and equality. It gets better. It definitely gets better. Some people are still struggling, and the society itself has to improve, however. Is something that people can look forward to. Chi Jun Ho from Brooks TV. Local boxing contributes to youth development. As a sport, it can be a source of self learning and discipline for both young men and for young women who participate in a ring. Mm, indeed, but hosting any event can cost a lot of time and money. So, how is boxing sustained for the youth of Oxfordshire? Sports is one of the ways to keep the body and mind fit and energized. We went to the Black Bedley's Amateur Boxing Club event to get a view of what it takes to put this kind of event together. A coach and organizer of the event spoke with me about funding. We're a self-sufficient club. 
We charge subs to children, which is £3 a week for children. The adults is a bit more. And then we are solely run by that and money we raise on this show. And local businesses sponsor us, which is really good of them. Yeah, we've got local companies, uh, 15 companies have sponsored this show, £100 per bout, which all goes into the club's coffers because we all work free of charge. We don't take any money from the club. We also spoke to coaches of the participating teams and they told us more about boxing and social development. Boxing's good in the way we, we, we take anyone. We, want to, we, take, we, we can take the you know, good of the bad, but you all you'll learn the same trade and you all and you'll learn the same and you all won. You understand what I'm saying? You all boxers won and you all get on, it's like an happy family. I definitely think boxing is very important for youth development, especially I box from a young age, so to see kids develop from a young kid straight up and not be on the streets is amazing. The spoke to us and they told us what they feel about boxing and youth development. Teachers and respect, controlled discipline, controlled aggression. I reckon my cousin should keep fighting here because he could end up being a champion one day, he could end up being a proper world champion. Kate Perisi, a coach and secretary of the Black Bedley's Amateur Boxing Club, spoke to us about the hopes for the future and the involvement of more girls in the sport. We're in a community centre at the moment, we have to put the bags up every time we go there, put the bags up, take them down, put the ring up, take it down. If we could get our own premises, we could have it open to more people. We'd like to have more girls involved. But at this moment, we can't really because of the premises. We cannot get enough people in and it's dangerous. Boxing plays a huge role in youth development and keeping kids off the streets but the participants feel more still needs to be done to support grassroots boxing. I am Samuel Lokide, reporting Brooks TV. And finally today, a new sport has come to our attention that saw one of our reporters race off to cover a practice session here in Oxford. Yes, and it's called Ludo Sport. Our reporter was more than eager to get involved and find out more. Lightsabers. The name. Sights and sounds have been with us for nearly four decades since they were introduced. And for a growing number of sportsmen and women, the concept has been reimagined and redefined into a sport that has taken on national appeal. I have been invited to a personal training session for aspiring Ludo sport duelists and allowed a glimpse at what could become the beginnings of lightsaber sporting combat. The international system across the whole world of the lightsaber combat franchise, Ludo Sport. It's combat with lightsabers, there's not much more to say about it. Ludo Sport in the UK has about 100 members at this moment, give or take a couple. International, I believe, would get me close to a thousand. I had to have a go. Years of watching childhood heroes vanquish evil had prepared me for my first duel with a Sith. It didn't go so well. The first time, or the second. And then, I got an upgrade. Ludo sport roughly translates from Ludo, which means fun and sport. So it's a fun sport. My job is to train pupils in the seven styles of lightsaber combat. The idea essentially is I am their go-to person for learning techniques but I also encourage them to fight each other to actually learn the stars against each other. As the training progressed, I began to suspect my Civ master was taking it easy on me. So while I was catching my breath, I cornered one of his apprentices. I've been doing it since April 2015 there, thereabouts. It'll be about two years this April. The comradeship is second to none. Everybody from the other classes from Bristol up to Birmingham down to London, they've all been great. <laughs> Everybody's been so supportive and just, just loved every minute of it. My time here is nearly up tonight, but the one thing I have learned is never bring a toy to a lightsaber match. Right? Well, that's everything we have for you this show, but if you want to see more stories, you can check out our Oxford Brooks TV News channel on YouTube. And if you have any stories you would like to see us cover, you can leave a comment in the comment section below. Or feel free to contact us at brookstv at brooks.ac.uk. See you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.